So uh, it's my pleasure today to talk to you guys about something that's kind of a changing field in how we manage chronic coronary artery disease and specifically uh, a focus on what do we do with our patients after they've had a myocardial infarction uh, and they're at kind of that junction point at one year afterwards. So this is two-year-old data now. Uh, but as most of you are aware, uh, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute is one of the largest uh, cardiovascular centers in Canada. Uh, so we do about 7,000 uh, angiograms a year now. We're doing 2,600 PCIs and we do about 800 standalone bypass surgeries annually. Uh, so a very large number of patients come through our doors and undergo revascularization procedures of which a large proportion of these patients are actually treated for acute coronary syndromes. And I think this is a very important graph to remember as cardiologists that even though patients come in with their acute coronary syndrome and we treat them with excellent medical therapy and revascularization, we don't cure the disease. We are really managing cardiovascular disease. You can see uh, in terms of event-free survival after an ACS, the highest risk period is actually the first 12 months. So about 8 to 10% of our patients uh, will have an adverse event. So that's a myocardial infarction, a stroke, or dying. But after those 12 months, that really high risk period, patients continue to accrue events at a 1% to 2% risk per year. And this is a lifelong risk. So patients are never truly free of the disease or cured of the disease. And so excellent secondary prevention and ongoing long-term management is paramount to minimize risk in our patients. So I did clinic yesterday. This is a patient that I saw in clinic. Uh, and I'm sure patients like this are seen every day uh, in all of our clinics here at the Heart Institute. So 73-year-old man, he has coronary artery disease and had a non-STEMI last year. So he's now one year post-PCI to his LAD. He had multivessel coronary disease. He had 50% blockages in his RCA and circumflex, which have been left for medical therapy. His ejection fraction is normal. He's diabetic, hypertensive, uh, and he's got polyvascular disease. So he's also got documented peripheral arterial disease. He's got a 50% carotid stenosis. He's got intermittent claudication uh, when he walks, and he's had a stroke before in 2016, which he was fortunate enough to recover from. His medical therapy is actually pretty good. So he's on aspirin 81 milligrams daily. He's on ticagrelor 90 BID for those first 12 months after his ACS. He's on a high dose of a statin. He's on Jardiance because he's got type 2 diabetes. Uh, and he's on low dose of an ACE inhibitor. And all of his risk factors are well managed. So what do the Canadian guidelines say about what we do with DAPT? So we're lucky enough to have Derek uh, So here, who is part of the writing guidelines for this, and the Canadian guidelines have just been updated. And what they recommend is that for our patients that have an acute coronary syndrome and have undergone revascularization, that they complete 12 months of therapy uh, with dual antiplatelet therapy. So that includes a baby aspirin and a second generation P2Y12, so either ticagrelor or prasugrel. And then at one year, they ask us, to reassess the patients and make a decision, how are we going to manage their risk in terms of uh, DAPT or an oral anticoagulant? And the guidelines, the way they're written right now, because they came out before Compass, suggest that if they're not at high bleeding risk, that we continue to Kegelor 60 BID. Uh, and if they're at higher bleeding risk, that we step them down to uh, monotherapy with either aspirin or Plavix. And now that Compass has come out, we've got the additional decision to make about whether or not we consider adding an oral anticoagulant. And that's because the pathway of, uh, of thrombosis goes through two uh, distinct mechanisms. Uh, the first is the platelet function cascade, and we target that with aspirin, uh, which inhibits uh, generation of thromboxin A2, or with P2Y12 inhibitors, so stopping ADP signaling between activated platelets. And alternatively, we can actually target the thrombin fibrin pathway to form a clot, because either of these pathways can lead to clinical events once a thrombus forms. And so the question comes, for our patient here, what are we going to do with his antiplatelet therapy? Are we going to consider an oral anticoagulant? Now, fortunately, we have really good data to help guide these decisions. So the first trial I'm going to talk about is the Pegasus study. And so this looked at long-term use of ticagrelor in patients with a prior myocardial infarction. It was published in 2015. And the goal of the study was really to look at, in that period from one to three years after a myocardial infarction, how can we best protect our patients? It's a 21,000 patient study, so it's a massive study. Uh, and they really loaded the study with higher risk patients. So the patients had to be at least 50 years old, and they had to have one other high risk feature. So either over 65, because that always makes you higher risk as you get older, diabetes, multivessel coronary disease, or chronic kidney disease. And again, you had to have that MI in that one to three year period. It tested three arms. So ticagrelor 60 milligrams twice a day, a low dose ticagrelor regimen, 
Ticagrelor 90 milligrams twice a day, uh, so the standard dose, and then placebo in addition to aspirin. And it had a primary efficacy outcome of CV death, MI, or stroke, and a primary safety outcome of TIMI major bleeding. Now, important to note, because uh, there's distinctions between the studies, TIMI major bleeding is major bleeding. So this is bleeding in your head, dying from a bleed, or having five, um, a drop of five grams per deciliter. So these are major bleeds. And uh, you guys know this data, uh, but ticagrelor is very effective at preventing further ischemic events in our patients who are kind of in that one to three year period. So you get a 15% relative risk reduction uh, or a 1.2% absolute risk reduction in events with either the ticagrelor 90 or the ticagrelor 60 milligram dose. In terms of harm or the primary safety outcome, TIMI major bleeds were higher with ticagrelor. And again, these are important bleeds. So we had about a 1.6% increase in uh, major bleeding with the 90s, 1.3% increase in major bleeding with the 60 dosage uh, relative to placebo. So what about the COMPASS regimen? So what data do we have to support use of an oral anticoagulant? Uh, this is a bit of a nice story because it's also Canadian based, so done by the team in Hamilton with uh, Dr. Eichelboom and Dr. Youssef, and they looked at using a vascular dose uh, of uh, rivaroxaban, so either the 2.5s twice a day, uh, in addition to a baby aspirin, so dual pathway inhibition, compared to just targeting the thrombin pathway with a 5 milligram twice daily dose of rivaroxaban versus simply targeting the platelet pathway with aspirin once a day. Very similar study in that the primary efficacy was a, comp a composite of cardiovascular death, stroke, or myocardial infarction. And a primary safety outcome, and I want to draw your attention to this, of, I of modified ISTH major bleeding. So ISTH bleeding is much less important bleeding. So it's also fatal and intracerebral bleeding. So those important bleeding endpoints are there, but it's only a drop of two grams per deciliter and modified because if you sought medical attention in any form for bleeding, that counted as a serious bleed. So if you went to your family doctor with a nosebleed, that counted as a major bleed in this trial. So a, a much more encompassing bleeding definition. To get into the study, you had to have coronary artery disease peripheral arterial disease or both. Coronary artery disease uh, had to be multivessel disease or prior myocardial infarction. You had to be 65 years or older. And again, this is just to increase the risk in the trial. And if you weren't 65, you had to have quote unquote enrichment criteria. So other vascular risk factors that meant you were a little bit higher risk. So diabetes, smoker, evidence of renal dysfunction, a history of heart failure or a history of stroke. And again, the COMPASS patients were pretty representative of the types of patients we treat here. Most patients had coronary disease. Uh, average age was 68. Uh, most patients had had a prior myocardial infarction. And note, this is important uh, distinction between the studies. Most patients were remote from their myocardial infarction. Uh, and then again, history of PAD, stroke, and diabetes. Uh, and what you see here in terms of the primary efficacy endpoint, uh, I think is pretty important. So you can see aspirin on the top line there. Uh, in between the targeting the thrombotic pathway with rivaroxaban alone, lowered the event rate, although it did not meet significance. Important to also note the study was stopped early due to overwhelming efficacy. So if the trial went longer, that probably would have beat aspirin alone. And then combination therapy of low-dose aspirin with vascular dosing of Xeralto uh, significantly reduced the risk uh, of events by 15%. In terms of bleeding, as with all studies of antiplatelets and anticoagulants, there was an uptick in bleeding. Uh, so there was a 3.1% uh, event rate uh, of ISTH modified bleeding compared to 1.9% in the aspirin alone dose. Importantly, no increase in fatal ICH or bleeding into critical organs. In terms of timing of benefit, uh, you can see that reduction of MACE, uh, which is the primary outcome, it didn't matter whether you were one year, one to two years, or three years into the study, you benefited from being on uh, the dual pathway inhibition. You do eat your bleeding up front, so bleeding events most commonly occurred in the first uh, 12 months of initiation of therapy uh, and is likely related to underlying pathology. So when you start patients on dual pathway and they have a polyp or they have an ulcer, obviously they're more likely to bleed. Thereafter, once they've been on the regimen longer, uh, major bleeding decreases. And again, the benefit in terms of reduction in mortality was seen again at all three intervals. One of the things that's a little bit distinct about the COMPASS regimen uh, is its impact on peripheral arterial disease. Uh, so in, within this study, they had cohorts of patients that had documented PAD, and they actually 
came up uh, with what I think we're going to see to be we're going to be seeing a lot more of in clinical trials is a definition of acute limb events, uh, looking at either acute limb ischemia or amputation, and actually targeting the thrombotic pathway as opposed to the antiplatelet pathway reduced the rate of acute limb ischemia and amputation. So really important endpoints for our patients with peripheral arterial disease. So how do we compare and contrast them? Well, I think they're kind of complementary uh, studies. Both of them reduce the rates of CV death, stroke, or MI. You do get a bigger reduction in stroke um, uh, with a compass pathway. Uh, you get a significant, uh, albeit uh, similarly sized, reduction in myocardial infarctions. And again, uh, significant reductions in CV and all-cause mortality in compass. Not not, these did not meet significance in the Pegasus study. The number needed to treat is similar, uh, and we did see a larger increase in bleeding with ticagrelor as compared to Xeralto. And again, not only is the size of the difference larger with Pegasus, the types of bleeds were probably more serious with Pegasus. Pretty comparable number needed to treat. So the question is, how do we make this decision with our patients now about what we're going to do long term for vascular protection? Do we just flip a coin and pick a regimen? And I think that we should probably be thoughtful about this. We're not going to get head to head data. So we're not going to know comparatively how these two regimens compete with each other. However, I think we can kind of pick our shots and pick our patients that we think are optimal for the two types of regimens. So first and foremost, I think patients who are at low ischemic risk or at high bleeding risk probably should have neither and probably should have single pathway uh, treatment with an antiplatelet agent. So again, your young patient with single vessel disease uh, who has no residual risk factors probably doesn't need either long-term DAPT or dual pathway. Now, factors that I would, when we're seeing patients that would make me select DAPT is there is higher risk stenting. So if the interventional cardiologist has recommended it in the report, or they've done complex stenting, so crushes, vein graft stenting, these types of things, that would probably make me favor ADAPT regimen, uh, as we have good data that antiplatelet regimens probably do better with stents. If you're closer to the myocardial infarction, so again, if I compare and I contrast the studies, uh, Pegasus was really in that one to three year period, and if patients are already stable on ADAPT regimen and are tolerating and are doing well with it, I would probably continue that regimen for them. Uh, and if their EGFR is less than 15, uh, so again, uh, you can use ticagrelor in patients who are on dialysis um, or very low EGFRs where you can't with Zeralto. So those would all be factors that would make me lean towards continuing with dual antiplatelet regimen. In terms of things that would make me favor rivaroxaban, if you were more remote to their cardiovascular event, and again, we all have lots of these patients that have been treated and followed for many, many years who have multivessel disease or polyvascular disease. If there was a history of stroke, that would make me favor Xeralto. Uh, and I must admit, if bleeding risk was playing into my decision, I think, although we don't have comparative data, I think that Xeralto is probably safer from a bleeding risk standpoint. And so if bleeding risk was playing into my decision, I would probably favor that type of pathway. So what, what do we do with a patient like this? And I think this is a patient where I would favor dual pathway inhibition. The patient has peripheral arterial disease. Uh, he's had a stroke before. Uh, and he's had re relatively simple stenting. And so I think when we assess our patients in, uh, moving forward, we're going to have to consider both of these types of regimens. And I think these are going to be nuanced decisions made by the cardiologists that are following the patients. I think we're going to have to make these decisions with the patient. And unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I think we're going to have to make these decisions in the absence of head-to-head -head comparative data. And we're going to have to make these decisions by understanding the underlying data and the pros and cons of each regimen. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions.